Greetings everyone and welcome to this exciting webinar on building next generation applications using generative AI. I'm Himanshu and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Uh, the world of AI is continuously evolving at breakneck speed and generative AI represents a revolutionary leap forward. <clears throat> its ability to create entirely new content from text and code to images and music and much more, more presents immense possibilities for reshaping countless industries. Again, in this webinar, we will delve into the fascinating world of generative AI, explore its potential to create truly game changing applications. We'll also hear from the leading experts who will share their insights on cutting edge advancements in the technology, real world use cases across industries, and practical tips and strategies for harnessing the power of generative AI. Uh, we are fortunate to have with us today a remarkable panel of experts who are at the forefront of generative AI. They are the leading founders of the companies or the startups, each bringing their own perspective and expertise to the table. And I'm confident that their insights will leave you inspired and equipped to explore the possibility of this transformative technology. Joining from my in-house team is Archal and Nitika. Uh, Archal looks forward the and new technology division at Textile Research and has experience of over a decade. Over to you, Anja. Uh, Anja, you are on mute. Thank you, Himanshu. Uh, so, Natika, can you start first? Then I'll take. Yeah, hi, good morning, everyone. I uh, hope everyone is doing good. Today, we discuss the extraordinary re realm of AI creativity and its endless possibilities. In this digital era, AI isn't merely a tool, it's a transformative force reshaping industries, augmenting uh, human potential and transform how we perceive creativity. AI in particular, generative AI in particular stands at the uh, forefront of this evolution, wielding the power to create in and inspire and innovate in many uh, previously unimaginable ways. Generative AI is basically the form of AI designed to create new content by learning from the existing data. <clears throat> Leveraging advanced algorithms, it pro produces unique outcomes that mimics human creativity. Generative AI basically offers diverse business applications uh, for that includes interpreting current content and generating new material effortlessly. Uh, next slide, Himanshu. Basically, the market for generative AI uh, for the 2023 year is around 42.17 USD billion, and it is expected to reach 335.02 billion with a CAGR of uh, 41.88. <coughs> And uh, in historical period, the market was 15.56 with a historical CAGR of 28.30. Uh, basically, the market for a uh, generative AI is booming because businesses are finding tons of creative ways to use it, making things that feel like they were crafted by humans, but with the help of smart machines. Key industries like life science, uh, education, and gaming stand to gain substantially from embarrassing, uh, sorry, embracing uh, generative AI technologies. Potential applications span specialized AI software assistance and the utilization of AI for content creation, presenting promising business prospects with these industry uh, sectors. Uh, 
नेक्स्ट स्लाइड हिमांशु नो इंडिया मार्केट द इंडिया जनरेटिव ए आई मार्केट इज वन फिफ्टी Fifteen hundred forty nine point one six USD million in twenty twenty three, and it's expected to reach fourteen seven eight point one three million uh, by two twenty twenty nine, with the CAGR forty forty six point three one. And the growth of the India generative AI market is propelled by digitalization and cloud computing demand for creative content. new developments in ai models work flow automations <clears throat> and all as a, uh, india aims for a trillion economy by 2030 automation in business operations will play a <clears throat> key role the adoption of chatbots in leading indian startups and corporation has already disrupted uh, con- uh, customer support roles and this trend is likely to con- uh, continue and expand in areas such as di- digital marketing sales software development and client serving <clears throat> uh next slide i manshu yeah now regarding the top industries for 2023 generative ai has significantly impacted various industries streamlining processes and enhancing experiences some prominent uh, sectors leveraging uh, its capabilities include entertainment advertising and gaming medical imaging life sciences education and manufacturing these industries are harnessing uh, generative ai to simplify operations create personalized experiences and uh, drive innovations marking a significant shift in how businesses operate and connect with uh, their audience audiences uh, next uh, slide manchu Now regarding the fundings of the top uh, startups in generative AI, generative AI is rapidly evolving and has the potential to disrupt various industries. And the companies like OpenAI, Hugging Face, and Jasper are push- pushing the boundaries of what's possible with AI-powered content creation and interaction. For instance, OpenAI, the creator of G- uh, GPT-3, has raised 28 million USD. Uh, and Tropic AI, which focuses on safe and reliable AI, has raised uh, 100 million USD. <clears throat> and overall, the funding of generative AI startups is growing rapidly, with a total of five point around 5.3 USD billion invested in the company companies listed below. And these investments are dri- driven by the potential of generative AI to revolutionize a wide range of industries, from content creation to software development to search. <coughs> uh, so yeah, now the top countries with generative uh, with startups in generative AI. In this, uh, you can see the US leads the way with. 200 to 250 generative AI startups, including well-known names like OpenAI, Jasper AI, Anthropic, Stability AI. This is due in part to a strong tech ecosystem, a talented workforce, and a supportive investment landscape. In uh, 2022 alone, the US saw 524 AI startups founded, attracting a 47 billion USD in non-government fundings. The generative AI startup ecosystem is still relate. Relatively young, but it's growing rapidly, and the factors that contribute to a country's success in generative AI include a strong tech ecosystem, a talented workforce, a supportive government environment, and access to funding. Over to you, Anshul. Thank you, Natika, for such an excellent insights. You have thrown up a good light on the quantitative aspects of generative AI. Here are some qualitative aspects which I am going to present now. the new categories for generative ai the new categories includes adobe sensei jasper ai chat gpt just a little information about adobe sensei it's a technology developed by adobe that incorporates artificial intelligence along with machine learning into various adobe creative cloud applications which help to enhance the capabilities and workflows for designers and creative professionals second one is jasper ai which is an ai writing tool designed to aid content creation for bloggers marketers businessmen 
Jasper generates original top-notch content suitable for blogs, marketing copy, and product descriptions by input basic information, and it gives the output through blog articles, social media posts, sales emails, website copy, among others. Third one is ChatGPT, which is a very famous tool nowadays. It is a language model developed by OpenAI based on the GPT, that is Generative Pre-trained Transformer Architecture. It's a sibling model to instruct GPT and is designed specifically for natural language understanding and generation and conversion like settings. ChatGPT can, uh, can be used for a wide range of natural language processing tasks, including answering questions, providing information, creating conversion agents, and many others other useful information chat GPT give. Another generative AI tool is BART. BART is an AI powered chatbot tool designed by Google to stimulate human conversations using natural language processing and machine learning. In addition to supplement Google search, BART can be integrated into websites, messaging platforms or applications to provide realistic natural language responses to user questions. Uh, BART can also access information from a number of Google apps and services, which is inclusive of YouTube, maps, hotels, flights, Gmails, among others. Another major generative AI tool nowadays is Dell E, which is a generative model developed by OpenAI that is capable of creating images from textual descriptions. It is an extension of the GPT architecture and the original Dell E model trained to generate images from textual prompts. There are some actual use cases where generative AI marks a good applications like logistics and trans transportation where generative AI can accurately convert satellite images into map views, allowing private, previously unknown places to be discovered. Second sector, sector is travel and hospitality industry where generative AI can help with facial recognition and verification systems at airports, hotels, and in hospitality industry, it is used in various ways like personalized trip planning, chatbots for customer services, virtual tour guides, marketing and advertising. Third one is retail, where generative AI can improve the customer experience and deliver personalized messages to consumers via email or online with relevant products to the shoppers. It can also be used to analyze customer messages or other communications for signs of frauds such as phishing attempts. Another is the supply chain energy sector. In energy sector, basically, generative AI can predict solar and wind output based on weather data and production history. Generative AI can use to forecast the weather data through sun or wind so that it helps in energy, energy and power sector by considering factors such as load balancing, congestion management, asset utilization, predictive maintenance, etc. Next is marketing and advertisement. Generative AI find application marketing and advertising include targeted advertisement, digital advertising, email marketing and campaign analytics, real-time media buying, sentiment analysis and analytics, and message personalization. Some of the countries which are major hubs in each of the region include, you can have a look like in Asia Pacific, it's China, Japan, South Korea, India, Singapore, and Australia. In Europe, it is United Kingdom, France, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, Netherlands, Finland, and Spain. In North America, of course, United States, which is the leading country all over the world, Canada, Mexico. South America, it is Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Chile, and Uruguay. Under the Middle East, the major countries are Saudi Arabia, Israel, UAE, Qatar, Iran, and Turkey. Under the Africa, the major countries for generative AI include South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, and Senegal. So some of the key trends for generative AI currently are GPT and language models. We can have a look on the trends. The development and improvement of large-scale language models such as OpenAI series marked a significant trend nowadays. Second is conditional generative models such as 
conditional variational auto encoders and conditional generative advertisement networks third is multimodal generator models the exploration of models of generative content across multiple modalities such as text images audio it become trend nowadays another one is improved training techniques researchers were focused on refining training techniques for generative models including curriculum learning reinforcement learning these approaches aim to enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of training large scale models so these are another trends for generative ai ethical consideration as generative ai system become more powerful there was an increased emphasis on addressing ethical concern including issues related to biasness in generative content potential misuse and the resp responsible deployment of ai technologies another one is real world application the transition from theoretical research to practical application of generative ai gained momentum nowadays industries various industries explored how generative models could be applied in areas such as content creation design medicines and simulation of course in real world another is interactive and user friendly interfaces the development of more user friendly interfaces for interacting with generative models making them accessible to a broader audience the last trend of generative ai nowadays is continuous learning and adaptation research focused on improving generative models ability to continually learn and adapt to new data ensure that they are relevant in dynamic environments thank you himanshu over to you thank you archel and nitika for sharing such wonderful insights i would also like to add that uh, as per the latest news uh, open ai is trying to raise another fresh round of funding at the valuation of 100 billion which makes them the largest a uh, startup in the world moving on to the next speaker is max tinclair who is the founder and ceo of ecomtent which is an tech stars by company that enables brands to create optimized product listings with the use of generative ai using ecomtent's self service tool customers can generate beautiful products lifestyle images generate infographics from hundreds of template that they have and generate optimized copy of any of the language welcome to you max hello good morning everyone um oh fantastic so you've got my slides for me do you can i share my screen i think it'd be easier because i have some animation in my slides is that okay yeah um can you see my screen here no sir is it okay now Um, do you mind if I share my screen? Just because I have animation in the slides in a minute. Okay. Uh, I think we are not able to add the screen as of now. Okay. No worries. I will go through this then. Can we? Can we go to the start? Yes. Sure. So thank you for thank you for having me. Um, as you can see here, uh, I spent six years at Amazon um, before I founded the content. As Himanesh mentioned, um, basically quit my job at Amazon in September 2022, and my co-founder showed me Stable Diffusion, which is one of well the first public model. And from from kind of seeing that public uh, model, where you could put in some text and generate an image, I saw how transformative Gen AI was going to be, and wanted to kind of jump in. So. Uh, founded econtent and econtent as, as you mentioned now is a uh, you know textiles back company sadly we haven't raised quite as much money as some of the other ones on on the slides that you showed before but um we help um e-commerce sellers generate content that's lifestyle images infographics and text um so yeah let's go to the next slide um 
so uh, as mentioned, I'll, I'll skip through these because I think you uh, was mentioned. Some of the stuff was mentioned uh, in the previous speakers, so I'm not going to not going to repeat this. But we're pretty wide range of applications, specifically in e-commerce of of Gen AI. It's been adopted by Amazon, Alibaba, eBay, um, et cetera, et cetera. Let's let's go to the next one. And um, and if if you guys uh, aren't using it, it's pretty likely that your your comp uh, your competition is and uh, and you can see here the growth in in using ChatGPT and also the density of of you know where where this is being searched. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's go to the next one. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna run through this again because I think this was covered pretty well. So let's just skip through this one. Let's, let's go to the next slide. Um, and here, I kind of, I kind of wanted to lay out how these, um, how these models work very quickly. So, I think the key thing to take away is that it's not, um, it's not magic. It's prediction. So AI models basically uh, are very good at predicting the next token. Um, uh, okay. Whether that be the next um, the next word or the next image, so when you're when you give it a um, give it a sentence uh, such as "Hello, how are you?" the AI model basically breaks down each word into um, into a num numerical value, or in the case of an image, a pixel, which is also just a number. And the more context you give it, the better it's going to be at predicting the next uh, you know the, the next number in that sequence. So let's go to the next slide, please. And the intelligence comes in through this compression. So this is a quote from uh, the chief scientist at OpenAI. And to summarize it, basically he's saying that by training these kind of lang large language models where you're compressing, uh, you know, all of the context, all of all of the content on the internet, what you're actually training is a model that. Um, is a working model of understanding the world, and it can, it, it can then um, quite accurately. Uh, it, it has a it, in order to predict the next word effectively, it has some kind of intelligent understanding of the world um, uh, where we are, and this is only going to get going to get more. So let's let's go to the next slide. And one question uh, you may have, which is. You know, if, if these are just models predicting the next word or token of great accuracy, how come when you use um, different, you know, you put in the same prompt, uh, you're going to get you get different answers back or different images back? And the answer is, uh, you kind of have this creativity for these temperature variations, where by controlling the temperature, you can change what percentile of the most likely next token comes. So you can either go for the top 0.5% or 0.1% or 0.05% with a hotter or colder temperature, which basically um, enables you to have variation in um, you know, the images and the text you generate. So let, let's go to the next slide. And the last uh, point here uh, on the technicalities is um, quality through fine tuning. So you have all of these base models, which I think uh, were, were discussed in the previous presentation. And then the content is to fine tune this data, uh, you know, on highly converting Amazon listings on, uh, and highly converting uh, like product lifestyle images. And then you have new models, um, you know, which are specific to a certain task, e.g. creating content um, for, for Amazon or, or marketplaces. So let's go to the next slide. So uh, the majority of my talk will be focused on prompting. So just to give a bit of background on prompting, uh, and hopefully that context helps. Uh, basically, AI models don't have like an understanding um, of text and kind of turn them into code. As I've heard, you know, some of my customers kind of talk to me. What what they are doing is they're basically taking in your prompt, uh, and then based on our fine tuning, they are then you know creating an image or, or or an output based on kind of the input that you give it. And the, you know, obviously as, as we discussed, the better the input you give it, the the, the higher quality that this output's gonna be. So let's let's go to the next slide. So um, we had 
and I can't really see this because there are faces along the bottom. So I don't know if we can move up. But we had um, uh, any content, we had a team of over 15 uh, computer scientists basically label up um, thousands of or, or hundreds of thousands of customers um, images. So what you have here, and again, I don't know, Jimenez, if we can move move the um, the kind of presentation of the people to the side so we can see the full slide. But um, we have two prompts from a customer and we ranked um, we ranked these images based off the quality and the accuracy of the prompt. So on the on the image on the left, you can't see it, but it says it, it's given, I think, a six out of 10 for quality. And they, um, I can't remember the, the number, but some number for accuracy based on the fact that not all elements of the problem is in the picture. And on the right hand side, um, I think I can't, again, I can't see it because the people here uh, in front of us, but it was a 10 out of 10 for accuracy and quality because, uh, you know, the, the prompt was a portrait of a beautiful woman wearing a pendant and the AI model, you know, re returned exactly that. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So here, you know, here's two more examples. Uh, on the left, we have a one out of 10. Uh, and, you you know, if you could see the prompt, you'll see that it's a very long prompt, which is quite confusing. Uh, and these are real prompts by our customers. And on the right hand side, you know, you have a shorter prompt uh, of a better kind of quality in terms of a camera lens and you know saying how the, the customer product which is this pedigree dog food can should interact with the image they're generating which is the dog and it got a nine out of ten in terms of accuracy and quality so we basically did this exercise of 100,000 images to try and understand like how we could um you know what the best practices for customers are when they're prompting to create lifestyle images for their product so if we go to the next slide so the tip number one is to follow um, the structure, this structure. So you should um, have three key elements in your prompt. You should have a subject, a scenario and location and, and descriptors. And basically um, you should you should write down your product. If you're generating a lifestyle image of, I don't know, this a glass, you should say a generic name for that product, glass, in or on the scenario location, such as on the table, and then a bunch of descriptors, which would be, you know, the room setting, like a living room, dining room, or, um, or, or these kind of things. So let's let's go to the next slide. So the subject, as I said, should just simply be the generic name of your product. So if the input image is a chair, like this office chair, you wouldn't say your brand or your uh, anything like this. You just say chair uh, as uh, to kind of tell the AI what you know what what the subject that is is generating for. Uh, next slide, Jimenez. The next one is a scenario or location. So if you know you're you're doing this necklace, you would say a uh, beautiful woman wearing necklace, and that that's basically explaining how your product should interact with the theme that you're you're generating. Uh, next slide. And then finally, you would put in descriptors such as um uh 50 millimeter portrait uh, photo studio lighting office background these kind of um you could almost call them keywords it's kind of give the ai a bit more uh you know information on the kind of product image you want to generate uh next slide so uh, the second tip is to experiment. So on the x-axis, we have uh, the quality ranking we gave on an image. On the on the, on the uh, y-axis, we had um, monthly customer use. And basically, we saw this correlation, which is the more that customers experimented with the tools, the better they got in, in the quality. Um, so I think it's very important to note that, like, Playing around, and you know, I'm sure this is true of ChatGPT and, and Midjourney and any other AI tool. The more you experiment, the better you're you're, you're going to get. Um, next slide. So, the third tip is not to be polite to AI when you're prompting. Uh, we saw a 12.8% increase in accuracy and a 10% increase in quality. Um, our hypothesis is basically this is due to the word count decrease. Like people who like if you.
I think we are facing some difficulties on the part of Max. So let's uh, move on to the next speaker. Uh, today with, we have uh, Lev Gorilla, who is the research director at Handshake Consulting, which is a resilient transformation consultancy, which helps organizations across the world to grow, transform, and create at the intersection of technology, strategy, research, and design. The company specializes in assisting organizations in the form of organizing workshops in creating generative AI solutions and systems. Over to you, Lev. Great. Thank you so much. Um, can we pull up the slides, please? Um, so yeah, as Himanshu said, um, I'm the research director at Handshake. We've been working on AI solutions for the last two years. And I think my presentation perfectly segues from Max's because he kind of covers the what and like the practices of operation. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to more segue to the how or like, um, what, where exactly to apply AI? So you hear all these things about its capabilities and what it can can do, um, but then you're like, okay, now what? How do I how do I practically employ this in my work stream? Um, and I'm going to be addressing uh, especially people who are either leading a team on projects where there's con content being generated at some stage, or maybe you're a solo entrepreneur where content generation is a part of your process. Um, Content generation for many of us humans is uh, a quite a time-consuming and costly process, and it takes a lot, a lot of skills to uh, write things well and uh, write things fluidly in a way that conveys the ideas in an effective way. Um, and generative AI has uh, miraculously has sh shown to be uh, good at at uh, describing ideas and writing things in a way. Um, in a way that that is fluid and very 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 uh, com compre comprehensible to 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 the public. Um, so next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about how to identify cases where you can generate generative AI, integrate generative AI into your work stream, um, into your chains of processes within your work, um, and generate uh, and talk about how to develop a strategy to. Iteratively, so step by step, slowly integrate uh, generative AI into the process. I say iteratively because, um, it, like with many things, you don't want to just jump in and just start uh, completely offload all your weight onto the model. All of our use cases are unique and um, like e exceptional, and you need to test run uh, if generative AI will apply and work in your specific case or not. Um, so there, 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 there's a process that we suggest on how to uh, approach integrating generative AI so you don't just completely uh, blindly trust it with, you know, your public or your content and uh, hope that it, it, it will just do exactly what you, you expect it to do. Next slide, please. Um, so first question is how to identify use cases. Where should you focus on uh, applying generative AI today? Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the truth is, AI is not gonna like do anything for you. It's still just a tool. To me, after using it for two years, I still approach it like the leap from typewriter to computer. Now we're computer to AI. Like, yes, it is a great assistant in, in writing and generating media, but like the typewriter is not, you can't just leave a typewriter in a room. It's not gonna write an essay for you. Same with generative AI. Like it's not just gonna like take over that task completely. Um, and, uh, so like, where will it help you, uh, excel and how will it help you excel? Well, it'll help you excel in what you already excel at. Um, and that's what you should focus on and where to identify use cases for generative AI. Use it for what you're already good at, because in all, in all of our splendid era, giant era of two years of working with AI, we've never seen uh, a non-artist become an artist because of generative AI. Uh, we don't we've never seen an, uh, somebody who's uh, who's not who hasn't excelled in writing become like a great writer using AI. Why? Because it takes an expert to know what look what good looks like. Generative AI doesn't know what good looks like. It takes your guidance and your input to um, for to guide AI towards something that actually is good. 
Um, and even though it'll offload a lot of the effort off of your shoulders, it's not just going to create good stuff without you your guidance. And the analogy we use is AI for media creation is like a tractor for farming. So if you're a farmer back in medieval times and you're using a hoe uh, to plow your field, a tractor is a, is a huge uh, output multiplier. It can plow in an hour what you what will take you a month. But if you're not a farmer and you have no idea how to how to make ground uh, sprout uh, fruitful uh, grains, then you can sit in a tractor all day and it's, not, it's just not gonna do the work for you is you're not gonna you're not gonna achieve anything uh because you don't know uh what to do and so same with generative ai so the question is what should you should you apply a generative ai for right now identify cases of what you're already doing what what you're already excelling at and test it in that use case next slide uh another thing that folks uh kind of assume which is not exactly correct is that ai will just do everything for you um in the sense that like you you just tell it to like write something cool and great and it'll just tell you and it'll just create something cool and great um but there's actually a sweet middle ground between uh writing about something that you uh know what you want to write and writing about something that you have no idea what you want to write and only in that sweet middle ground will this generative ai really come in handy so if you don't know what to write, you, you just like you just know you want to generate a blog post, but like for for your like LinkedIn or something, but you don't you don't um, you don't know what about yet, and you tell generate AI, please generate me a cool LinkedIn post in whatever you sell at like business consultancy, and it will do it, but it's going to be pretty generic, uh, it's going to be pretty cookie cutter, um, and it's not going to be stimulating. Uh, you will need to give it more information, usually outside information, your own research, in order for it to write something that's actually compelling for the audience. But, but it's also not exactly great at the other extreme. If you know exactly what you want to write down to the sentence and the style and like the, the, the wording that you want to use, the likelihood that generative AI is going to generate exactly that is very low. You're going to have to iterate through many, many, many cases. Um, in order for to get to that point um and as you're probably going to spend more time uh t t trial of trial and error rather than just going ahead and writing it with your hands um so you really want to uh think of a generative ai where you have some information you have some ideas and like a blueprint of the article that you want to write but you don't have a, like a perfect picture in your head of what exactly what you want to write and then that sweet middle is where you want to uh, apply generative AI. Next section. Next slide. Um, and uh, so there, there's there's a cycle that you want to go through uh, when you when you are approaching generative AI applications and thinking like, okay, so here's a use case. I'm like consistently writing like weekly blogs for this post or like I have uh, an essay or a proposal I need to generate and it's kind of similar to, in some ways to proposals that I generate all the time. So how do you wanna approach integrating AI into that process? Um, and we suggest this like cycle of explore, experiment, adjust. So explore, so see like how, just test run it, just go ahead and <clears throat> put, type it into chat GPT, you're not gonna get what you're looking for, I promise you on your first trial, uh, see what kind of wording you use, uh, see how you approach AI with instructions, uh, see what kind of samples you you offer to it to replicate. Um, and so you will shift into experiment where you're like, okay, so I'm not just like seeing the boundaries, what AI can and can't do. I'm actually moving towards my specific application, like what, what works, what doesn't work. And then you will arrive at something that is good enough and then you can start adjusting small pieces. So like, um, yeah, as, as Max said, you can start working with the temperature or um, start working with the samples that you're feeding it in and see like that, see where, what, what becomes good um, in the long run. And, you know, if you're writing a single one page proposal, there is going to be a cost benefit analysis that'll tip against AI. Like you're going to spend more time um, going through this experiment, ex explore, experiment, adjust cycle than you, if you would have just written it by, by bare hands. Um, but uh, if you were writing like many proposals and they're just like 
just the subject matter and the the person who you're addressing is changing, then it makes a lot of sense to um, uh, go through a cycle because you can just change a sample from like environmental studies to um, wh whatever, like uh, uh, ed tech applications, and it'll generate the same, the same proposal because your instructions are clear and good. Uh, you ex explain the context of who you are and like your background and that'll change the same. Um, and you uh, you have a specific style that you've trained it on with your prompt. Um, so so you would only need to change a small bit, like the samples and maybe some uh, specific words and instructions for it to start outputting what you want. So then it very much makes sense to uh, invest into the development cycle because um, because then you can replicate this over and over. It's an evergreen uh, tool that you have in your tool belt. Next slide. So now you've uh, you found a, a use case and you've tested it and you see that it works. So how do you strategically test and integrate generative AI applications into your workflow? Because um, as I said, it's not gonna do it for you and it's not gonna do everything. So how can you see what, where it can and, and can't be uh, of use. The the uh, the analogy that we use often is like, although we don't want to humanize generative AI, it's completely not human, and um, it doesn't do many things that humans do, and it does a lot of things that humans can't do. Um, but a, a useful first step is to see it as like a very smart intern that entered your office. And that intern read everything on the internet. It's just like it's just been scrolling for a very very long time, but it has no idea who you are or what you're doing or what your goals are. And so you have to go through a process of explaining it. Okay, so I'm, um, I'm at this company, this is our mission. Like this is kind of like the lingo that we use in our webpage. And this is like the specific task that you wanna, that you wanna achieve in this application. Um, and so how do you wanna see if this intern is actually gonna be good at it? And how do you wanna uh, start um, thinking of where to apply this intern into your workflow? Next slide. Um, and what, what you're going to do is something called a task decomposition. Um, oh, unfortunately, I see there's like a little uh, font uh, skewing, uh, but uh, I think the general information is still there. Task decomposition is taking the task that you are performing at your work and breaking it down into smaller and smaller component parts. Because as, this intern is going to need all the details it can get in order to actually achieve what you want. Um, if you've ever been like a project manager, You've probably been in a situation where you tell somebody what you, what you think is very clear instructions on what needs to be done. They follow your instructions exactly as you set them and you get back and you're like, oh, this is actually not completely not what I wanted because I forgot to mention this, this and that. Um, so uh, what you need to do is decompose tasks, things uh, bring to light things that you took for granted and uh, like uh, things that you like were unspoken within your team or within your workflow and really speak them out loud. Um, and this is what's, what is called task decomposition. And what you're seeing, what you're noticing is, hey, this is not an AI problem. This has nothing to do with AI. We haven't touched AI yet. Um, and B, that uh, explaining things to AI once it's clear in your head is actually the easy part. Uh, playing with AI because it understands natural language um, it's pretty good at just like hearing, hearing, um, hearing you out and doing what you say. Uh, the hard part is saying what you need, what you need clearly and succinctly. Um, and so I'm going to show you what what the what the four steps of task composition are for AI specifically. Next slide. And so this is the four steps that we've developed in task decomposition specifically for. Um, for AI, you, 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 this is a process for automating tasks incrementally. So, so slowly offloading your effort to, to AI. And as I said, the first step is back of napkin. So you don't even touch the AI. Uh, we call it back of napkin because you take a piece of paper or like a, a napkin if you're at a conference and you quickly draw out your workflow strategy just on the piece of paper. If you're in a team, this is a, a, a dynamic conversation. You get everyone together and it's like, okay, so, I know I tell person A to uh, generate a blog post and then person D uh, eventually uploads uploads it to our social media. What are all the steps that we go through uh, in between that? Next, you go to Wizard of Oz where you uh, 
manually just go to chat gpt and you like uh test run manually so you actually type in the prompt in there and start experimenting with the use cases that you found see if it works we call it use a wizard of oz because in the wizard of oz uh when uh dorothy comes to the wizard there's a big glowing head and he's doing magic and then they pulled back the curtain and it's actually an old man pulling levers um and same with ai like it'll it'll look like magic but it'd actually be you like manually typing things in and like very very uh kind of diligently following the steps and then um once you have a minimum viable implementation and you see something that works then you start prototyping and building out uh, uh prototype applications um uh and what i mean by that is you can start building an app on top of that prompt uh, which sounds intimidating, but it's actually with a lot of no-code tools that are being created around AI applications. You don't have to be a coder or like uh, know a, a app development very well in order to build out something where you uh, type in uh, what you need into a text box. You click generate, and it'll generate you exactly what you're, you're looking for. So you, in a Wizard of Oz section, you would create a prompt that stably generates like future forecasts, let's say, and then um, and take out the word uh, generate a future forecast about blank. And then usually the prompt has a very long description of what a future forecast is and like all the details and all the sections that you want. And then at blank, you uh, you leave blank. And then in the prototype, you uh, put you create an input box and you say future forecast generator. And there's an input box where somebody can type in anything they want. And those words just like get plugged into your prompt. Um, um, and 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 it'll and it'll you click generate and voila now we have a future forecast generator that looks like magic up front but again in the back end is just a prompt with uh, uh, a fill in spot in in, in 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 the text box and then after you're done you build build it out um, you you add more functionalities you you fine tune it um, um, if, if, if you need like a very specific language, fine tuning is actually not something that majority of people will need to use um, uh, because prompting can take you very, very far. But if you hit a wall with prompting um, and uh, then you can turn to fine tuning and adding functionalities and uh, 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 kind of polishing the prompt to make sure it's ideal. So let's go through these one by one in more detail. Like the next slide. Uh, so let's start with back of napkin design. Um, so again, drawing out your steps and making them clear and succinct. Next, next slide. So let's say you're writing a thought leadership blog, um, and uh, you realize that uh, it in order to do this, you're like you first need to read a bunch of articles and then identify a consistent theme among articles and collect certain articles and posts uh, from that theme and to create a data set. And then build out uh, a, an article from that data set. Um, again, not something we actively think about when we write an article. We just like go on a computer and start, you know, typing away uh, and kind of looking for articles as we go. But like when you sit down, you're like, oh, actually, there's actually nine steps that I go through every time I write an article, and this is them. Um, and so you've created these steps, and then you want to continue breaking down each step into smaller and smaller steps, making it as clear as possible. So next slide. So like reading articles on social media posts. Okay, so like you're not uh, you're not just like reading them in, in in a book. You're going and looking them up in specific search search engines, and then um, you scan them for specific keywords, um, and then you use specific keywords in the search and in a search box in order to pull up the links that that are actually best for you. All of these can eventually be offloaded to an automated app. Um, which eventually integrates AI. So all of this would be very important to uh, to make clear. Um, um, even if you don't don't eventually automate these these steps, um, you uh, you it'll still be good to know that like this is what I need to do before I offload to AI. Okay, so this is how much how much workload there is prior and post generation, and this is where the generation comes in. So next slide. And so, as you can see, you can keep breaking things down ad infinitum, and it's just a best practice to see how far you can go because um, it's very useful to know for your internal team on how things work, so that if somebody leaves or um, 
there's a, a shift in the team, you you can um, continue. Uh, you can plug somebody in, and that somebody could uh, could be AI at any point as it gains more and more functionality. You can take on more and more of these tasks. Next next slide. So next is the Wizard of Oz. So actually, like uh, moving things around. Um, so let's see. Um, as, and so as I said, uh, you literally you see you've identified an AI application. You see everything that's been done before, and you copy and paste all of those articles, and you put them in the prompt. At this point, uh, uh, OpenAI and uh, uh, Claude AI, I believe. Yeah, I think it's Claude. I'll accept up to 200 pages of 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 text. Um, that's both prompt and output. So you can literally put in like the first 100 pages of Harry Potter, and it'll generate you an alternative ending. Like the world's your oyster. There's really no no um, no limitation to how far this can go. Um, so so uh, you can make a prompt as long as you want. You can plug in all the research that you've dug up. Uh, from the internet and uh, just keep just try test running it. See see if you can arrive at what's called a stable prompt or a prompt that consistently generates what you want, even if you change a keyword of what it's about. Uh, the, the future forecast generator being an example of that. Next slide. Uh, next, you build a prototype. So you try to automate more and more steps, um, which again sounds like uh, a high star to reach for, but it's actually not that hard. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what, what, one thing that one tool that really makes this useful is Zapier. Um, <clears throat> Zapier has been around for over a decade. They just connect, uh, online tools with other online tools. So like, for example, like going from an email to a Google sheet or like going from light switch in your house to, to trigger something online. And now they've integrated open AI into their giant ecosystem of apps that they can integrate with each other. And it is really like. There's really no limit to what you can achieve with these automations. Um, uh, a student of ours in our generative AI masterclass, which I highly suggest you check out, um, he created uh, a tool where they, up, they upload an image to a Google Sheet, and those images automatically go to uh, OpenAI and uh, the GPT-4 model, which can now interpret images. That that and the model then it creates a long description of what's in the image, and the, the, it even works very well with diagrams and scientific um, scientific uh, models. And then it'll upload that description back into the, the Google Sheet. And so now, uh, for students who have poor vision, they can rely on that to like sit in class and as they go, like get full descriptions of what's on the slide deck. Um, and he did this without any coding knowledge or any knowledge of Zapier. He just started looking up on YouTube if this is possible, found the guy that pulled it off, started copying what he did, and voila, now he has like a cutting edge tool that I'm sure nobody has tried before that any and every university can use. And he just used developed as a, as a human, human, humanities professor. Um, so as I said, once you created a prompt, you can start building this out. And Zapier has app creation tools now too, where you can create a web page on Zapier that has an input window and the button generate, um, and and actively take what's input into that window, plug it into your prompt, and uh, float the response back to the viewer. Um, and you can make money off this. You know, this is like a very lucrative tool. We're kind of like where we are, we're at the young age of the internet when somebody, like a bunch of college kids just created YouTube, became like millionaires overnight because they've had an intuitive feel that and the internet needs a spot where all videos live and they created it and then it's just, and it just lives there. AI is in the same stage. Like there's a lot of applications out there that have not been created um, um, and are just waiting to be, uh, to be created by somebody like you who have an intuitive feel of what the audience needs. Um, and so once you arrive at a stable prompt, you really have a product that you can uh, float to, to the public or to your team and make, make your process much easier. Um, all right, so next, next, next step. Uh, and from there, you can, you, you, you can start building, building the app out. And I'm going to quickly, I think I'm running low on time, so I'm going to very quickly 
go through what problems you might face and what how you can address them. Next slide. So one problem is your models are hallucinating, um, which uh, which means that um, they're generating stuff that is not actually true. So if, right now, if I like go to uh, uh, like GPT three and it's asked who's Lev Gorlov, uh, it, it'll just start inventing a person, Lev Gorlov. Um, GPT-4 now says, I don't know, or at least it should say, I don't know. It still kind of feels sometimes. Either way, um, it, it will make stuff up. So what do you do? Next slide. You do something called retrieval augmentation, where you embed data either into your prompt or with special tools um, uh, in, in, into the model, um, like or more like a, a layer on top of the model, so it'll be it'll be generating based on the information you gave it, as opposed to just make, uh, inventing things or trying to pull stuff off the internet. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that, that that's one use case. The other use case is uh, next slide, please, is something called uh, search engine en enhanced generation, and this is something again that models are adopting on a very rapid rate where they can reach out through a search engine, find the relevant information, pull it into a prompt, and then generate something that's actually factually based. And um, when you generate something, you can actually look back and be like, oh, where, where did you get this from? Like, is this a fact? And they'll show you the link um, that you, uh, that where pull that information from. U.com is an example of a search enhanced generation. Again, with some some uh, effort, something that you can create on, on by yourself. Next slide. Uh, and then after you're done creating, you're going to do something called red teaming. Uh, and that is uh, where you make sure that your model doesn't do something that uh, that you don't want it to do. Like, say, say some inappropriate things or, like, completely um, misunderstand a certain subject. And what you do is literally... Uh, sit down with a bunch of people you trust and you ask it, try to make it say something awkward or wrong. And if it does, you add to the prompt, hey, if, if somebody asks this and you put, type in the, the question that made it say something wrong, you're like, say this instead. Um, you actually dictate it to like what you wanted to respond. And that way you patch up holes in your application to make sure it's, it's foolproof, which... Um, uh, any any uh, AI application developer will tell you that it can never be 100% foolproof, uh, but it, you can get it to 90, 95%. And then after that, float it to the public or your team. Um, so that's it for now. Uh, we'll be taking questions in the end, I know. So uh, stick around. I will j uh, drop some links in, in the chat um, uh, for you to about our course and about the, the links that I mentioned. And yeah, see you, see you in the questions round. Uh, definitely. Thanks, Liv, for sharing all those insights. Uh, I would like to quickly go back to Max again because we dropped him in the middle. Max, are you there? Sorry. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Sorry for uh, dropping off my so Wi-Fi. Let's, not continue. Right. let's continue from where we left. So I think I did this slide. So tip three, yes, is, is not to be polite to the AI. Um, your uh, by decreasing the amount of words, your accuracy in, in quality increases. Uh, next slide, please. Um, tip four is for generating um, images of humans. These are the two people we generate in our tool. Close-ups work best. If you're trying to generate full bodies of humans with limbs and this and hands, it's not going to work very well. Um, next slide, please. And then lastly, it's really important to check your spelling and grammar. Uh, the AI is, with, is already going to struggle to try and generate the content you want without um, having some issues here, which, which could confuse it further. So in summary, um, uh, next slide, please. In summary, uh, the five tips are to use the structure subject in on uh, scenario location descriptors, to experiment, uh, not to be polite, uh and uh i think number four there was from memory um can't say it the screen uh to to use close-ups of humans and then lastly to check your spelling and grammar so if we go to the next slide 
So I think the we were asked to kind of prepare how we how we're applying Gen AI to uh, specific industries. So in in the e-commerce space, we're helping to increase. You know, content is super important to conversion. Um, Amazon has said that adding lifestyle images increased conversion up to seventy percent. Uh, next slide. And we've seen our uh, AI generated images, such as these ones here, um, increase the conversion of of of, um, of customers. Next slide. And we've also kind of built. This is a um, this is a video that isn't working because it's a PDF. But we built an ability to generate not just images but also text and infographics. Next slide. Um, and lastly, um, kind of we're we're in the mid stage, I think, of the AI evolution. We're going to go to the next stage soon, which is AGI, which is entirely separate discussion, which I won't go into now because of time. Next, next slide. So yeah, I did, that was the end of my discussion. Um, we have a 10% off e-content if you scan the QR code here. Um, him, him, Manashu, if I, if I put some links in the chat, I've got some free resources. Will, will you be able to share them with the webinar audience? Okay, so I'll link to you guys uh, our free prompt engineering guide. And we've also built a GPT um that enables you to like craft a good prompt which is also free if you have an open ai uh subscription so i'll link those in the chat thank you for listening and and yeah have a have a lovely rest of the day uh thank you max for sharing valuable insights and uh, again we face some difficulties now we are past that moving on to the next speaker which is shubham singh who is the director of customer success at lena ai which is an AI work assistant specially designed for modern businesses. Uh, basically, Lena AI empowers enterprises worldwide to redefine how employee engages with work, deliver a transformative impact on productivity and efficiency. Mr. Singh is leading uh, the dynamic portfolio expansion for global markets in India, Middle East and Africa, and SIA by leading a dynamic CS teams of customer-centric entities. Over to you, sir. Perfect. Thank you so much, Manshu. And uh, good to good to hear uh, from the last two speakers. I would request Manshu if you can pull up my presentation. Uh, I want to keep it short, relatively around the enterprise uh, automation uh, and what has been happening globally uh, in the worldwide uh, enterprise industry, wherein Gen AI has actually impacted a lot in the last couple of years. Um, frankly speaking, about uh, 2021 till date, uh, and with the onset of uh, LLM models and Gen AI models like uh, OpenAI, GPT, Bar, and the other uh, giants, what have come together, what Lean AI does, and what we are bringing into the uh, enterprise automation is virtual assistance, right? Um, AI, ML, Gen AI powered virtual assistance, and we automate with the help of these virtual assistants. And so our aim is very simple. We are trying to solve and save time for employees at the same time, give analytics to the leadership C-suite and at the same time, uh, deliver employee experience because that's something which which is uh, at a gapage in the enterprise system. Can we move to the second slide? Um, the problem here is very simple because in the dynamic landscape of enterprise technology over the last couple of years, businesses are ex adopting and expanding into LLM models, uh, adopting to virtual assistants uh, to drive business efficiency. And that's not just in one department. Uh, they start uh, starting from HR to IT, then dwelling into legal finance uh, uh, and other departments. Enterprise automation is everywhere. Uh, but the problem lies is that while we and enterprises have adapted to GPT models, LLMs, um, now everything is fragmented because there are a lot of tools. Everyone wants to dwell into the Gen AI space and AI space. However, with the onset of it, there's a lot of fragmentation in the industry because GPT does not just integrate well with enterprise knowledge management systems and ERPs or, or CRMs and HRIS applications. Hence, it becomes an incomplete solution because you may get content out of uh, these GPT uh, models by automating them, but you may not 
uh, get one stop solution for your uh, enterprise automation wide uh, for example automating the complete knowledge base of your organization let's say uh, automating the whole service management of your organization automating the whole legal department of your organization i'm going to give you an example of it uh, imagine a big bpo uh, which has 100000 employees worldwide may have more than 1000 uh, policies more than thousands of uh, sops and articles right meld across different different tools but with the help of generative ai what can we do we can we can actually create and automate all of this information into a single repository wherein um, earlier and i'm i'm just going to go back to two years back wherein employees or, or what we call used to call chat bots right as an as a user i used to go to the chat bot ask a query right if that query was hard coded fed uh, with the help of rpa right i would get a certain answer right which would be robotics automated right and then came open ai and gpt which start they're giving me answers more contextually and human like in nature right it became more conversational and that's exactly the transformation that has happened in last 2 years uh, that from hard coded automated responses to giving generalized uh, or personalized responses with the help of uh, llms is is the transformation journey we have received and then and, and that's that's a problem with lean ai is also solving uh the, the one one more example what just comes to my mind is that with the help of enterprise automation imagine as an employee you imagine you you are you are based you are into a setup of a large scale organization yeah you get into a meeting with one of your prospect clients uh, right who's who's uh, um, a ceo let's say uh, who let's say lev is 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 a is a founder of one of the organizations right you you get into a conversation with lev and and during that 60 minutes conversation you dwell a lot into the generative ai space and how latin america particularly right is expanding and so much investments are happening so many startups are booming across latin america which are into the gen ai space who are leveraging llms who are leveraging machine learning right and what could be the next 10 years landscape of this industry now that's a lot of data during that meeting right uh, there are already tools uh, outside in the market who kind of create mom's for you right uh, who kind of create tasks for you but imagine after right after that call all of that you had discussed right get summarized in one step solution right you get all the mom's let's say you discussed about that you're traveling next 3 day 3 days later you're traveling to a place right uh, and that you would in the mom you'd be you would also be in by being and attaching a case study based on uh, based on uh, a similar industry where where lab um, is is uh, working right and your virtual assistant right after the meeting creates an mom listed on task right rule based tasks right first of all it understands all the vocal uh, conversation right what you had understands the emotion during that conversation right creates mom for that conversations then the second step go back go back to your contact right that could be a gmail or your inbox right uh, go back to your contact right finds out lev's gmail or, or or email id right writes an mom to lev at the same time then goes back to your drive to your company's drive seeks for a case study which could be similar to the industry where lev is operating right attaches that presentation into that mom right and then sends it across and at the same time also pulls up your calendar looks at your calendar since you have already mentioned during the your your meeting that next 3 days later you're traveling for next 7 days to xyz location right so in the calendar itself uh, follows up for a next meeting right and also mention that you are not available for 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 like the next 10 days since you're traveling to xyz place and you'll be coming back so also uh, follows up and gives a couple of uh, uh, open open slots for that uh, for let's say 10 days later right all of that task based orientation is happening with the help of and with the amalgamation of gen ai llm and ai models together and that's exactly where the enterprises are going to nurture themselves in future because 
we we have automated a lot with the help of RPA. Right, the first revolution went into the automation of RPA. Then then came your uh, open AI, right? And we automated content, right? Now we are getting into personalization, where content, not just content, uh, the Gen AI tools will also understand uh, um, images, videos, right? And that's that's exactly what's happening. We are creating images, we are creating audios, we are creating conceptualized uh, content for everyone, and that's that's the problem we are also solving here. Can we go back? Can we go to the next slide? Perfect. And that's that's exactly the solution which Lena also portrays. What Lena deploys and does is that we are an enterprise solution that eventually caters and centralizes all service management. Uh, and knowledge management of an, any organization at enterprise level. We start from uh, HR service desk, service delivery to IT, then go, goes to finance at CM, other BAE, we use, right? And all of that is happening in a one-stop solution for all the employees. And why, why are we doing that? Because there's a lot of fragmentation, right? A lot of fragmentation in enterprises, people have plethora of tools and platforms to jungle upon and that that takes time right and that that's specifically where we want to elevate employee experience we want to save time and we are doing that can we go to the next slide please thank you uh i want to i want to uh, share how llm at lean ai works and how generally also uh, llms work with the help of ai uh, llms are large language models uh, like we know and uh, they run on pre-trained databases, right? So we trained with humongous data sets of information, content, image, video, right? And all that those data sets available uh, in, in, the, in the industry uh, and for enterprises, let's say for XYZ enterprise, we want to automate all of their data, contact images, right? And all the data sets which are there available in that organization, we kind of imbibe all of the, all that data, we train uh, with the help of our own proprietary uh, LLM that is that we have named as Work LM, that's Lean AI's proprietary LLM model. Uh, and the very first thing when happens is, as an employee, let's say I come on the platform or the application which is deployable anywhere, so I can access my uh, Work Assistant on on Android, iOS, let's say on Slack, Teams, uh, on my in, in my inbox, in Gmail, Outlook whatever we can think of known WhatsApp as well, right? All I have to do is just sign in and let's say I type a simple query that am I eligible for, let's say, am I eligible for a car loan? Or let's say, um, I, I say that I don't, I don't have, my PC is running slow. I'm, I'm let's say a very, very difficult question. My PC is running slow. I'm, I'm, I'm currently on Windows XYZ. Um, can you help me? Um, kind of clear out my system, right? So that I can run smoothly and my team is not also efficiently working, right? There are so many prompts in the single query, right? Uh, what what the LLM does is the very first time when a user asks a question, the, L, the LLM ident identifies the language, then on the other parameters, the user role to personalize engagement. When, when I say user role, uh, Language, obviously, there could be uh, multi-model language is available. Then the user role could be I may be of XYZ designation from a particular location, right, of a particular gender. And any organization, any enterprise would have different policies for different designation, different locations, right, and for different genders, of course, right. So that personalization happens at the third step of oh, when I, I've already asked my query, right. So as a third step, work LM, right, these LLM models, they, they went they, they goes searches for relevant and parallel information across the knowledge sources, right? So I may have gigabytes of knowledge trained into these uh, sources, right? So they goes into the sources, gets out the data, right? Personalizes it, creates a, a relative response, and then throws out uh, as, a, as a as a response to the user, right? It may be relative to the user, it may not be relative, and the the accuracy what uh, these LLMs generally work is uh, between seventy seven to ninety three percent of an accuracy. Uh, while at, while we at Lina AI we we are working at a ninety eight percent accuracy because we have guard railed all the data. So if we have we are automating for X Y Z 
enterprise we only will guardrail data for that ent enterprise right so so there is no data leakage because that's one of the key factors when we are uh, implementing any gen ai or ai or based models it becomes very relatively important to keep the data set secure right and all the pii is in place uh, so that uh, so that we don't showcase any personal information we don't rule it out because we are integrating with these large language models and let's say if, if the model understands that it, it may not have a higher accuracy then it, it relatively pulls out and asks the users to raise a ticket which is which could be a service ticket it could be incident ticket right and it could be just a redirection to uh, connect with their uh, with their de designated spots and that that's where and if that doesn't happen on the other side, uh, the work LM or the LM model uses cognitive reasoning, right? And and logically uh, to logically construct a comprehensive and precise response. And those happen so that for two reasons: one, that we stay constant and contextually uh, personalized to the uh, to the user, right? And those conversational conversations can 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 help the user feel more. Uh, uh, accepted right and and that thereby elevating the employee uh, experience altogether and yeah uh, and the, the final uh, where once uh, the llm verifies the final response for factual corrections it removes all the piis right and biases because yeah one of the things which llms and uh, gen ai applications uh, does on a regular basis is hallucination what uh, we have heard of uh, in the industry but hallucinations are just training the data uh, if the data is trained on large sets of global open source uh, platforms and obviously hallucinations would happen once we guardrail these data sets right for a for a specified user base is when we can achieve a higher level of accuracy in in our user information and and thereby uh, can we move to the next slide perfect now uh why these virtual assistants are important and, and virtual work agents are important for a, for a couple of reasons and they're very very simple these are available on your fingertips around the clock you don't have to connect with uh, let's say you have an hr query you have an it query you may have something related to a query to your legal or finance department as an employee i'm just talking about and i don't want to get to someone at 12 midnight obviously i cannot i can i may just raise an email i may just us, I mean, they may just Slack or put a Teams text, but I don't want to do that because that may hamper my productivity. Let's say an employee who's working uh, in different shifts or hours, right? And somebody uh, in in cross border uh, Teams is not available at the moment. What would happen, right? That I would lose my productivity. So that's why these these uh, virtual assistants are available around the clock, twenty four seven. They have quick res resolution and responses because all the data data sets and knowledge bases are already pre-fed uh, they can and it's a single go-to platform so the whole delivery and automation of an organization right can be in 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 one stop right in one platform and those platforms could be anywhere right so the base of that virtual assistant stays one however it can be deployed on multiple uh, channels like i had already uh, shared and at the same time uh, they can be upgraded and they can be trained not just and there's no in manual intervention that has to be led right uh, we have integrations with the with apis and everything happening uh, simultaneously right in real time so as as the moment right the data is getting uh, updated right it also is getting retrained because what's happening imagine an organization uh, that has a uh, very, very very simple an organization uh, let's say deploys a virtual assistant for hr right and that has 100000 employees and 100000 employees within a year i mean raises let's say 5 lakh queries 5 lakh queries on knowledge on uh, policies on articles and on sops right and there could be and there could be let's say out of those 5 lakh queries 1 lakh queries were very personalized independent where the knowledge was not present however during that course of an year agents answer to those queries right and those queries were also were they were also getting trained at the back end in the platform so by by that what next one year everything which was not trained into the uh, virtual assistant right uh, with the help of machine learning with the help of gen ai it will learn itself right and by next year you would have a large database built with all that information pre-filled and trained together 
so that's that's the uh, that's the way these things are happening and uh, these virtual agents can help us and obviously the the best part about this virtual agents right that they are intuitive they're human like and your con conversations are very intuitive uh, we, we can dwell into many more such uh, uh, many more such use cases which are happening in the in the gen ai uh, in, in the gen ai uh, enterprise industry for that matter uh, ticketing analytics every organization these days every enterprise organization would have at least a ticketing platform or a service desk platform for hr and it which would have humongous data built in right but at the at the at the end of it there is no analysis the only analysis what the c suits are getting as of today is the slas right how many tickets are being raised how many tickets are being resolved right what kind of categories and subcategories these are being traded upon but for that you have to go to the dashboards look at the dashboard and look at vast data yourself look at presentations and those charts and pie, right and and everything let's say as a c suit i don't have time for that i just want to type in a query and get a response that what happened to all the 200000 tickets that were raised in last two years in my organization imagine you are a ceo of an organization right i just want to know which country well let's say which category which country some people are raising the maximum tickets and are those tickets are uh, at all being resolved or not and if they are being resolved and that's the third query within a single query let's say those uh, tickets are being resolved are people happy are my employees happy with the resolution of these tickets and and those are the kind of prompts uh, uh, the the ceo puts in into a large language model uh, analytics automation imagine right and i get a response to it that this particular category from this particular uh, country this particular department is getting is getting the highest level or has received the highest number of tickets in last two years and these th this was the percentage of the tickets being resolved the, and, and people this percentage of people were not happy right and uh, these were their reasons right so i get to know what my people are actually thinking and i don't have to go to a dashboard look at your uh, humongous data for that i all i have to do is just type in my query i can know whether uh, let's say i i just i just have to talk about uh, if i have to understand when we can automate anything right we can automate service uh, customer support in bpo industry we can automate retail retail is hyper personalization what is happening these days uh, and all of these industries uh, let's say for a very simple example airline says uh these days you you also touched based upon hospitality and travel that uh, personalized uh, uh, itineraries are being created but out of uh, in the personalized IT, I, i mean itinerary creation airlines is are also adopting one more thing and that is every airlines every airplane would have a 1700 or a 1800 pager book or an sop right what happens if somebody somebody is ill right falls ill uh, within a i mean in, in in a 32 hour long flight what happens so automating all of that with with automating all of that data with these generative ai tools right so that of the pilot or a cabin crew just type in a query right that what happens right what should i do because this is the situation and you get the response out of it right that's the level of time saving that's the level of automation we are talking about in the um, in the, in the current space but yeah for the organizations in the enterprise delivery three things would matter a lot in the next uh, couple of years one is what do i want to achieve right with gen ai right second what kind of uh, what kind of skills will my people need right to be to so that so that we implement such technologies and tool and the third most important would be uh, once i have implemented all these technologies what would happen to my employees would i be able to reskill them that is one and second if not then how would i create more jobs because there would be a lot of job displacement happening with the onset and with the ongoing gen ai picking up boom So yeah, uh, on that note, I I would uh, kind of close in my statement. I am open for questions once everyone is done. Yeah, over to you, Himanshu. Please. Chan. 
Uh, thank you, Shobham, for helping us understand about the LLM and the significance of virtual assistants. Also, uh, again, uh, thank you for helping us understand that how Lena.ai works. <clears throat> Moving on to the next speaker today is Mr. Ajay, who is the founder and CEO of GenExa.ai, which is an enterprise gen AI platform providing strategic consulting and execution capabilities specific to generative AI. Uh, GenExa AI helps clients with strategic aspects like formulation of AI strategies, uh, alignment of business strategy, and planning AI adoption roadmap. Uh, at executive level and execution level, it helps with the use case identification and uh, accelerating prototype to production journey. Uh, Ajay is also considered as the leading expert in the field of AI, ML, and generative AI, and has been recognized as the top voice in AI by the Linden. So, welcome to you, sir. Thanks, Imanshu. Thanks. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, I'm the founder of uh, Genexa.ai. We are, uh, you know, uh, an enterprise Gen AI platform uh, where we, you know, help enterprises of all sizes uh, in all stages of their AI adoption journey to kind of, you know, move on to generative AI platform for the enterprise use cases. Um, we have our own, uh, you know, uh, low code, no code platform where, uh, you know, uh, the enterprises can come and develop their own solutions. We also have pre-built accelerators, right? We have uh, like, uh, you know, our, our speaker, uh, Shubham was explaining about co-pilots and about virtual assistants. So we have, you know, certain level of pre-built accelerators in terms of chatbots, co-pilots, uh, you know, workflows and everything uh, which which enterprises can use in terms of quick adoption for generative AI solutions within their organizations. So <clears throat> with that, I'll start my presentation. Uh, please help me move to the next slide, Himanshu. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's a dawn of new era, right? I mean, with generative AI, a lot of, uh, you know, industry experts, a lot of thought leaders are hailing this as the new, uh, you know, bend of technology. It's, it's a new curve of technology. Uh, for example, Bill Gates feels that after the graphical in user interface, this is the most important advancement in the field of technology. And why he's saying that is because, you know, through the LLMs, basically what has happened is uh, a new era of interface between humans and machines, right, has opened up. So with graphical user interface, what happened is that it gave humans and machines a kind of interface, a, a visual interface to work together, right? And that is how we now use all our windows, we use Office, we use most of the software through the graphical user interface. Now with LLMs, what has happened is, now the machines are able to understand natural language of humans, right? So it's a new interface between humans and machines in which humans can still use their natural language. They can still give commands in their natural language. The way we use chat GPT, we ask it questions in, in our own natural language. And these machines are now able to make sense of what humans are asking. They're able to make sense of all the, all the knowledge, all the, you know, everything that is there in the domain uh, in terms of understanding the, the breadth and length of information that is available, right? So that is how there's a new interface now available between humans and machines in terms of a natural language uh, uh, where, you know, you can tap into the machine's intelligence, you can tap into human intelligence and human plus machine come together in a, in a new way to deliver solutions and deliver uh, technology to the world, right? Uh, similarly, Andrew Ng, one of the greatest, uh, you know, AI experts of all times, so, you know, he's also uh, a great proponent of generative AI, and he also feels that this is a foundational technology, just like we had electricity decades back. Then we had internet, which was a foundational technology changing the entire technical landscape. Similarly, the generative AI is also a foundational technology. It will seep into various different aspects of our life, our personal lives, our you know corporate lives, our work lives, in various different uh, different. Uh, devices and everywhere and it will create a foundational shift in terms of how we use these uh you know these uh, uh devices or how we do our work how do how we learn 
how do we interact with the world everything will be changed according to that right can we move on to the next slide please Yeah, so this is a, a, a kind of a bird eye view of what is the adoption of enterprise adoption of generative AI across different uh, industry segments, right? So if on the left, if you look at, uh, you know, the, the picture at the left, you can see that within marketing and advertising, you can see about 37% of adoption. Technology very close, about 35%. Consulting, again, close. Now, these are more of your content generation, your knowledge uh, leveraging industries, right? I mean, when you talk about consulting, when you talk about technology, there's a no lot of knowledge leveraged economy over here, right? Even in marketing, advertising, there's a lot of creative aspect, there's a lot of content creation. And these are the places where generative AI has a lot of impact because generative AI, by definition, is a technology which can generate new content for you it can generate new data patterns it can look at the existing data patterns it can look at existing uh you know trends and insights uh, hidden in the data and then it can learning and create new patterns new trends and insights for you right and that is the power of generative ai so that is why marketing and advertising within technology software generation code generation within consulting knowledge generation report generation within teaching again you know creating syllabus creating questionnaires uh, creating you know all all the all the materials through which you can you know you can uh, deliver teaching or you can deliver learnings to your students within accounting within healthcare as well right uh, on the right hand side what you can see is that you know you can see the amount of exposure across different industries uh, employees have to generative AI. So within advanced industries, almost 85 to 90 percent of 80 to 80 percent of people are already exposed to generative AI in some or the other way, right? So either they they have used it once or they use it regularly. They use it for work. They use it outside of work. About 80 to 90 percent of employees across different industries have already started using generative ai in some or the other aspects so that kind of exposure we are talking about and mind you this technology is just about one year old right i mean november 2022 we, we are you know one year one one year and one month into this new technology and this has been the fastest adoption of technology ever seen across any consumer technology across b2b technology across any piece of technology you ever see so that is the kind of impact we are seeing for generative AI. Can we move on to the next slide? Yeah, so this is, this is you know, um, a view on the overall adoption journey for AI within, within any enterprise, right? I mean, this is, this is the way we view an enterprise adoption journey for AI across uh, enterprises of any size, organizations of any size and any you know, any level of readiness, any level of maturity within AI adoption. So if you see that the, the topmost layer is the is the layer where, you know, these are organizations which are just about starting for their AI adoption, right? I mean, they have they have read, they have understood what AI is or, you know, their, their knowledge about AI is also still maybe at a very basic level, but they have never tried to solve anything through AI in their organization. So, you know, they are at the right, initiation level of the uh, their adoption journey and that is what we call as an ai user mindset so at this level the organizations look at available technology available ai solutions in the market available ai apis in the market and they are just about looking at how they can leverage this already available ai tools solutions and how they can start uh you know working on some of their pilot use cases so you can see you know there are uh, towards the end uh they end up doing some pilot use case so they start with some ai strategy then the next step is that you know they would want to align the ai strategy to their business strategy right because that is very important when you're adopting a new technology the third step is to develop an ai first mindset within your organization so whenever a CXO, whenever uh, any decision maker thinks about solving any of their business problems, their mindset should be that, can this be solved through AI? Well, you know, if I have to solve this through AI, then what are the building blocks I need in terms of data, process, technology, people, 
to solve this this piece of uh, problem at our end right so that kind of mindset needs to be fostered within your organization that everybody starts thinking in those terms that how do we leverage ai how do we bring ai automation or ai intervention in terms of solving our problems the next step is to check your technology and data readiness right i mean as we know and this has been like told numerous times and will be told numerous times that your ai is as good as the kind of data that you're sitting on right and the data doesn't mean only data it doesn't only mean digitalized data it means data which is ready for consumption by your ai algorithms it is ready to give you that sort of intelligence it has that kind of hygiene it has that kind of structure it has that kind of insights built into it which which will you know help the algorithms get intelligence out of that data so we are talking about that kind of data readiness and finally you are ready with some pilot use cases in terms of you know under uh, you know uh, identifying that these are the use cases we should first start implementing ai so for example for a lot of companies it makes sense to implement chatbots or copilots as their first pilot use cases because uh, you know these are the places where they engaging with their customers and they want to give customers a, a beautiful experience in terms of engaging with your company so that is where you know a lot of companies start piloting these use cases start using ai within the organization the next st stage is where you have now developed a certain maturity in terms of your ai journey you understand what ai is you have also implemented it in small and uh, you know some primary use cases now the next step is that you're ready to augment your mindset right you're ready to expand further from those use cases so the next level is where you start thinking of developing a center of excellence within your organization where you know you have all the experts come in uh, and and uh, form a team uh, this team is responsible for developing the technology for doing the research and de uh, design within your organization developing policies frameworks ethical boundaries of how you want to use ai within your organization uh you keep on working on your data infrastructure you work on your governance and ethics you identify your important business outcomes right what do you want to impact by using ai and finally you are ready to move on to mature use cases so you expand across business units you try to find such use cases which will which have impact across business units right so you are expanding your use of ai from one business unit to across the business units and the final stage is amplify right now here it's it's a very advanced level of ai adoption in an organization at this stage the organization has a ai value creator mindset so now you have a lot of grip lot of understanding of ai application you have solved pilot use cases you have solved mature use cases you have developed a center of excellence your data infra infrastructure is sound your governance and ethics are in place now is the time to amplify your impact using ai across the organization right now you want to move towards becoming a fully autonomous organization where ai is able to seamlessly autonomously take decisions you know run business processes run entire business for you basically right and so at this level what you want to do is you want to have a value creator mindset where you kind of you know expand across the organization you partner with your larger ecosystem you build thought process uh, thought leadership within the industry you show yourself as a thought leader within ai space within your own industry domain space uh you kind of you know uh, reinvent start reinventing the entire organization all the business processes using ai right and finally you reach a stage where you know you're completely autonomous you're completely driven through ai within within the organization now remember when we say completely autonomous it doesn't mean humanless right at each and every stage human oversight becomes even more important as you go further and further in your ai adoption journey and this is not only because of the kind of technology and the kind of power of the technology that you are talking about but even the regulatory space will go in that area where regulation will uh, mandate to have all the ai systems have oversight of humans basically right so human oversight will have to be built into all of your business processes you will have to make sure that ai is regulated and it is well controlled by humans right it is not crossing the ethical boundaries it is not becoming counterproductive to your business and to your human resources right so humans have even more strategic and important role to play uh let's go to the next slide 
so now this is very important right i mean uh, you know uh, the overall generative ai stack now we are we are going into deeper into the technology itself that when we say building next generation apps through uh, you know through generative ai as a technology generative ai as building blocks right the various building blocks so how do you kind of stack these different building blocks from right from the foundation level to compute level to cloud platforms uh, to fine tune models so you know how do you kind of stack each and every layer on top of each other in terms of building your own generative ai applications right um so i'm sorry i <clears throat> i can only see if, uh, yeah i mean is there a way for uh, shubham actually i'm uh, the screen is getting uh, a bit covered by all the people uh, down right i mean i cannot see the full screen okay no worries i'll i'll kind of manage right so um yeah so you know in terms of this overall generative ai tech stack uh, you know what we are talking about in terms of building blocks at the most basic level you have your computation models right and you have your computation layer so you know we have been hearing a lot about gpus we have been hearing a lot about nvidia uh, you know uh, these these super uh, powerful computer chips uh, which everybody is after and they want you know these this is the hardware stack on top of which you can build your foundation model because that is the kind of computation power you need in terms of building your uh, foundation model so you know at the most basic level you have this computation layer in terms of your gpu your computational uh, machines and and uh, uh, power, powerful machines at the most basic level on top of it you have the cloud platform so you know you have uh, microsoft azure cloud uh, google cloud aws now you know because of a lot of scarcity around gpu not everybody is able to get uh, their own gpus and that is where cloud platforms play an important role in terms of getting you that compute power so most of the people today are using uh, you know gcp or they are using azure platforms or aws in terms of getting access to these super powerful gpus right and this this has become like a gpu as a service uh, business today right you, uh, you know depending on how much of uh, gpu time or how many clusters you consume you you pay as you go uh, in in terms of building your generative ai apps the next layer is most important the foundation models and as we know the foundation models the llms the gen ai models whatever we call them are you know basically divided into two sets so one set is your closed source or proprietary models right the open ai model the cohere model anthropic cloud model ai21 these are all proprietary models which means that these are closed source you cannot look into these models you don't know what kind of training has gone into it what kind of code source it, it contains uh, you don't own the model the model is is hosted outside your organization so your data has to go outside your organization in terms of using these llms uh however you know these are some of the most powerful models available today in the market right today businesses um leverage the kind of uh, inference and the kind of accuracy that these models are are delivering and that is why they have an important role to play in terms of building enterprise apps the other uh, part is the open source models where uh, these models uh, you know you can host these models within your own infrastructure you can work on the code base you can you can you know change the code base you can uh, kind of modify the way these models work you can make them your own by fine tuning or by kind of you know uh, modifying these models and these again are playing a very important role in terms of giving you total security and control in terms of building your generative ai apps because when you use open source you have complete control on the llm model on what kind of data you're using the data doesn't have to leave your organization right so that is very important in terms of getting you complete security and control on your ecosystem uh the next level is uh, fine tuned models domain models model training so you know fine tuning models with your own data right i mean today the models have been trained uh using some um general level of knowledge right i mean they have uh used data from internet they have used data from public sources in terms of training these models but how do you bring your business context 
into these models. So by, by fine tuning these models with your business data, you can bring your business context, you can make sure that these models deliver exact uh, inferences and exact predictions according to your business. So that is a uh, layer that you can see at fine tuned level. Uh, then is the layer around prompt, prompt engineering. I think a lot of speakers have covered prompt engineering. There is the entire layer around deployment. There's the entire very important layer around monitoring and observability of these LLMs. Again, because it's a very powerful technology, what kind of data is going inside, how it is being used by the model, what kind of inferencing is happening, is there bias, is there uh, you know, uh, non-sensitive data being used, all these things are very important. And finally, you come to the uh, upper layer where you can you know, do application development in terms of your horizontal apps, vertical apps, Somewhere in between, you have this, uh, again, the data platforms to kind of build your uh, enterprise layer on top of it. So vector embeddings, vector databases, and other things. So you know all of these layers or some of these layers definitely come into play as you kind of uh, move along in terms of uh, building your um, ecosystem, right? And any, any generative AI app that you have to kind of build these layers have to be touched upon right uh, can we move on to the next slide so yeah uh, now let's go uh, into a couple of actual applications right what kind of applications you can build using generative ai and what you can see over here is an application around chat with your data right now uh, you know uh, a lot of our speakers were talking about how can you build uh, you know, how can you leverage or assimilate all the knowledge base within your organization and then use it to kind of, uh, for example, Shubham was giving an example of, you know, somebody uh, midway in a flight wants to understand what is a standard operating procedure for an emergency, right? Now, that's a lot of data, a lot of manuals, a lot of PDF, a lot of uh, text and image data, uh, which, 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 can tell you about the SOP, but how do you quickly query this data and get a very specific answer in the nick of the time? So that is what is called chat with your data, right? I mean, the, this is the this is the architecture that works behind such a system. The the example that Shubham gave. So what happens here is you can see that you know down below you have uh, uh, an an open AI service. You have a document intelligence. Now these are layers which are consuming all that. PDFs, all that images, all that textual image, visual video data within your organization. And what they do is that, you know, they summarize all this data, they understand all this data, they draw all the insights out of it. So, you know, at the central level, all of this data is getting assimilated. You also have option to ingest more documents, right? You also have option to ingest your own other documents in terms of the building that knowledge base. and all of this knowledge on the right hand side then flows to algorithms which can do cognitive search so for example when when you say that what should we do in an emergency of uh, let's say engine failing if you do that kind of cognitive search if you, if you give that kind of query uh, you know this cognitive search model can quickly delve into this database which has been structured with all the data it can give you quick uh, quickly give you an answer or an insight into what should be the the line of action so on the chat front end, which is the topmost layer, answering user, user layer, you see, uh, there you can get your answer. That is your interface in terms of getting the answer back from the system, right? So this is a multi-tiered system. You have your, uh, you know, you have your uh, customer-facing or client-facing layer. You have your middle application layer, and you have your backend layer where all your data is being, uh, you know, ingested and assimilated through generative AI models, basically, right? So this is how this works in the background. Can we move to the next slide, please? This is another uh, very, very widely used application, GitHub Copilot. Uh, we, we talked about Copilot, how it can be an assistant to you in terms of helping you with your, uh, 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 you know, uh, your daily work. So for example, you know, you're a coder, for example, you're a consultant, you're a chef, you're uh, you know, working on a shop floor, anything, anywhere, you are always looking for that extra bit of intelligence, extra bit of knowledge, to help, which can help you do your work easily and better, right? 
so in those terms this co-pilot becomes your peer peer uh, worker right it becomes your virtual peer uh, worker which can kind of you know quickly uh, give you insights and intelligence into how to kind of uh, do your work better and similarly you can see here also open ai codex is the way kind of uh, you know uh, uh, gives you that kind of intelligence it it consumes all the code and text on the internet and it is able to kind of give you that kind of uh, intelligence in terms of writing code so it can modify your code it can write code for you it can do all kinds of things in software engineering space for you right uh shubham just a second i'll have to take a break my uh, machine is running out of battery i'll just have to plug it in so just give me one minute i'll be back on this one Uh, in the time being when Ajay, I think Ajay is joined. Yeah, sorry, I, I had to kind of move near to a plug uh, power source, but yeah, I'm back. Yeah, can we move on to the next slide? So, you know, in terms of our own offerings, like, I mean, how do we help uh, clients in terms of building their solutions, right? I mean, uh, as as, Shub, uh, as Himanshu was mentioning earlier, we are into the consulting space, we are into uh, GPT Studio, we are into managed services, right? Uh, in terms of helping the clients build their uh, solutions. Uh, so, uh, you know, we are starting with the consulting space where we help clients build uh, uh, an actionable strategy, uh, an entire adoption journey for their AI uh, roadmaps and everything, right? Uh, in terms of doing that consulting. Uh, in terms of Dev Studio, as we mentioned, a lot of these generative AI apps need these building stacks, right? I mean, you need the foundation model access, you need vector database uh, layers to build your uh, retrieval augmented systems, you need uh, computation, you need uh, deployment models and everything. So a lot of the studio, uh, E offering helps you in quickly prototyping and moving to production, right? I mean, you don't have to invest in terms of building all this tech stack. And that is where a lot of these uh, studios help you in terms of quickly setting up your uh, applications, building applications, testing it out and moving towards production. Similarly, managed service, because a lot of this knowledge and understanding is, is uh, you know, needed in terms of building these generative AI apps. And that is also something we provide, right? Uh, again, this is a bit around uh, deep into our, uh, you know, our uh, offerings. Maybe we can take this as part of the question and answer. Uh, this is to give you an idea of, again, how does this uh, generative AI platform work? And this is very important from building next generation apps that as we as we looked at the tech stack earlier also, right? I mean, right at the at the foundation level, you need the access to foundation models. You need data engine. Uh, there's a developer studio which can quickly help you build your accelerator apps, everything around co-pilots, chatbots. Uh, there is also a curated collection of pre-built apps available with a lot of players, including us, including I'm sure with Lina and, and a lot of other players that uh, you can kind of, you know, leverage and, and kind of start quickly working with your generative AI solution. And finally, the most important thing is to have enterprise grade data security, built-in control, safety features to keep your data secure and uh, you know uh, in terms of uh, working with the llms because uh, a lot of your business critical data a lot of your organization critical data might have to go to the llms today the llms are still evolving this entire space is still evolving so uh, you know a lot of data security a lot of enterprise grade built-in controls and guardrails are needed uh, which which you know you can get from the platforms that you're working with. So again, this becomes very important in terms of building the next generation AI applications, Jenny applications. Yeah. 
that's a bit about me i think we covered in the in the uh, original uh, uh, introduction by himanshu also um but yeah i mean that's that's what we do in the space of generative ai right uh, over to you himanshu uh thanks ajay um i'll try more it yeah uh thank you for sharing your presentation with us it was really informative to have you here uh i think we are running out on time so we'll quickly take few questions and then we can wrap it up uh, so starting with shivam first uh shivam how do you think that generative ai technology is going to impact the labor market and uh, especially in tasks where repetitive tasks are there or repetition is involved okay so like i mentioned earlier also um that with the onset of generative ai and uh, these enterprises adopting uh, pilots and implementing uh, use cases of generative ai a lot of uh, displacement in the job market will happen and that's already uh, has started uh, happening if you if you look at the data from linkedin jobs feed there has been a spike of 1000% in just q3 of 2023 in the gen ai artificial AI, uh, intelligence uh, machine learning kind of skills right which organizations are hiring at the moment 1000% and and if i look at the google data google itself uh, stating that there has been a spike of 1500% right on a month to month level in last 6 months just people wanting to talk and search about generative ai so um, yes while it will uh, while these applications these use cases will help uh, organizations automate a lot right and uh, help in uh, time management help uh, people to navigate more towards productivity at the same time a lot of job displacement will happen reskilling has to be thought by the uh, thought leaders a lot in next 6 uh, months to a year because when these job displacements will happen right employee experience will go on a toss and that's already has started happening right so uh, like i mentioned earlier during my presentation three things to be talked about by every organization one what do they wish to achieve right with the uh, generative ai in place second during that implementation what skills would they need right so that can they reskill and upskill the current employee set right if yes nothing more than uh, nothing uh, better than that and if they cannot upskill or reskill their current uh, employees right then how much of a hiring would they need to uh, to maximize on their productivity and then the last part if the reskilling cannot happen right what would happen to those employees right so now is the moment for employees also to invest a lot in upskilling and reskilling themselves right so that by 2025 or 27 at least 70 75% like we all know that about 75% of the job market right every worker would need some level of automation right or some level of automation would have already hit their uh, workmanship so reskilling has to be done by both ends by the employers by the employees as well right and employers have to think of a broader picture that how can they reskill right and and leverage gen ai in uh, in development right learning development of their employees from the very onboarding itself so not just think about employees who are already onboarded or who are in a later life cycle of their uh, ecosystem but from the very first stage of onboarding if we can leverage a thought leadership a learning culture with the help of all these models available in the market because with the help of these models we have the data we have the content we have the visualization and we can also personalize on the learning development of uh, our employees so i think this is how it's going to impact the the uh, labor market on a broad scale a lot of rescaling a lot of upscaling has to happen in next 3 years and yes both the ends has to rescale and upscale not just employers it's uh, it's the same responsibility for the employers also to think about their uh, upliftment and rescaling as well definitely uh, coming back to ajay ajay uh, what do you think that how can developers ensure that generative ai applications comply with the data privacy regulations like gdpr and ccpa
Ajay, can you hear this? Ajay, I just want to mute. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Sure. Can you can you uh, repeat the question? Sorry, I got lost in uh, something. Okay. How can developers ensure that generative AI applications comply with the data privacy regulations? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, I think very important for uh, as I was mentioning, right? I mean. Today, uh, there are two ways to build generative AI solutions. There are two different kinds of foundation models available in terms of building generative AI solutions. One is your proprietary source models where, uh, you know, it's, it's a closed source model. We don't know what kind of training has gone into uh, developing these models. Uh, but the other option is to use open source models. Now, in terms of making sure that you are, you know, complying to data privacy, Definitely bigger players like OpenAI, Anthropic, and uh, you know uh, the Microsoft of the world, they make sure that you know the data that is being used in terms of building enterprise apps for generative AI uh, is not being used for uh, LLMs internal training, right? So they give you that kind of data privacy, data security uh, assurance. However, if you still feel that data privacy and data security needs to be within your control, then the best way is to use open source models in terms of building your uh, generative AI tech stack. That is how you can have complete control and security over the kind of data that is going to these models, the kind of data uh, you know is being used to train these models. Uh, and in the future, we'll see that a lot of these um, generative AI applications will be built on open source models in the in the interest of having transparency and complete control and security on the overall ecosystem. Okay, uh, thanks Ajay for sharing those valuable insights. Um, I would like to thank again all the speakers and all the attendees who joined us on such short notice. It was really an informative session. We received a great response on this. Thank you, speaker. Thanks, Ajay. Thanks. <laughs>